Yesterday we start began with the dukkha unsatisfactoriness from impermanence. We are led to dukkha unsatisfactoriness, or impermanence leads to unsatisfactoriness. Because it is un- impermanent, it is unsatisfactory. <clears throat> because it is unsatisfactory, it is not self, un- uh, non-self. Selfless, not utter. They are all conditioned phenomena subject to these characteristics. Now, we talk about also this dokha, which is uh, the suffering, physical and mental suffering, which is very obvious, serious. But the other dokha that we are talking about is not like that. This is the kind of dukkha which cannot be avoided due to this process of arising and passing away, and that is causing unsatisfactoriness. Hence, such a nature is unacceptable, detestable. So, this kind of nature is dangerous nature, hence dukkha, unsatisfactoriness. One can ask, how about this? physical and mental suffering, are they not also dhamma nature? Uh, it is, of course, this physical and mental suffering because of the body, that is this physical suffering, because of the mind, that is the mental suffering, such as dosa, patiga, anger, ill will. If one is not free from these negative emotions, one is bound to be led to this dominus uh, mental distress. So being tormented by these rising and passing away, nature of rising and passing away, <coughs> that is the mind, this mind body is subject to this rising and passing away, uh, it is suffering, unsatisfactoriness. If uh, one has not practiced Dharma, like, uh, like uh, as we are doing now, then we will not consider this unsatisfactoriness as unacceptable and detestable. Now in the body are these uh, unpleasant feeling, the metal also unpleasant feeling, and uh, this is, uh, so we become afraid of that, they're despicable, so this is, as human beings or as beings we are bound to face this unsatisfactory nature. We are bound to face them. When one faces, one is, or one is faced, or one faces such unsatisfactoriness, dukkha, unavoidably, then uh, we always, uh, we, we lose courage, or we then face such uh, unsatisfactory nature. We, are, we we don't have we don't possess enough courage to face such unsatisfactoriness. So, as uh, by reason of dukkha, one is led to the sense of uh, samvega, that is, sense of urgency and uh, earnestness. Then we look for something pleasurable to uh, go to get over this unsatisfactory nature. So, because of this dukkha, we have a sense of urgency. So, if one is not able to find the real, genuine happiness for the practice of the Dharma, then until then we will not be able to overcome this unsatisfactory nature, nor will we will have, will have this power to withstand this unsatisfactory nature, because the mind has not developed enough strength and has not cultivated enough knowledge to be able to withstand or to put up with this unsatisfactory nature. 
So once one has developed one's mind, so the mind is developed and be able to be, become awakened through knowledge, then one is said to be able to overcome this unsatisfactory nature, this suffering, the impact of suffering, and be able to withstand the onslaught of this suffering. And everybody is bound to suffer this worldly conditions or experience or face these worldly conditions, loka dhamma, good or bad conditions. Then we have this yasa ayasa, yaso ayasa, lava alava, lava alava, uh, having gain or loss. Lava means uh, uh, having some gains, gain, gaining wealth or gaining material things. And uh, alaba is loss of material things or not gaining material things. Yaso ayaso, having much following or less or no following. And then this uh, blame, having being blamed or praised, these are worldly conditions. And then happiness and suffering. All these things are worldly conditions. So if one has practiced the Dharma and uh, developed the mind and uh, cultivated uh, knowledge, then one will be able to face these worldly conditions. Because one has uh, energized one's mind in advance. If one is not able to do that, then it's not going to be uh, very comfortable. If one has not cultivated knowledge, if one has not developed the mind, then one will one will lack uh, this uh, repelling and withstanding power. Now we are practicing this Satipatthana method in order to uh, cultivate the mind and insight so that we are able to overcome uh, the uh, unsatisfactoriness um, and then have uh, possess both the repelling and the standing power. So in this way, if one faces, then when one faces, one does not uh, have, one does not take, one does not uh, practice in advance, and then, all of a sudden, one is confronted with the worldly conditions. Then, if one is not prepared, then one will start to complain about these uh, contradictions, and that is not uh, required, that is undesirable. Now, with the practice of Satipatthana Bhavana, uh, we, are, we have enough energy and enough courage in order to face these eventualities. These worldly conditions, Loga Dhamma, that we have talked about are bound to impinge on any being, so long as it is a living being. And uh, if one has not uh, prepared, one has not, uh, one has not prepared oneself in advance with the practice of Satipatthana Bhavana and cultivated the mind and insight, uh, the impact will be very forceful, very serious, unbearable. If, on the other hand, if one has uh, developed the mind with enough energy, like uh, building a great wall, so that uh, whoever comes and uh, you know comes against the wall, then this wall will be able to withstand any impinge, any impact of any thing, anybody. So also one will be able to withstand like a wall. If one has uh, practiced Satipatthana and has cultivated the mind and insight, uh, this uh, Satipatthana gives assurance. Whenever one is faced with his worldly conditions, uh, if one, face, one is confronted with good and bad conditions, one will not be elated or dejected about this good or desirable, agreeable or disagreeable objects. Instead, one will be able to build up the state of equilibrium so that one will be relieved. And this uh, practice of Satipatthana gives assurance. 
as has been propounded by the Buddha in the beginning of the great discourse on mindfulness to inspire the faithful uh, with the uh, giving the benefits, beginning with the purification of the mind, so the mind will be developed. And this uh, benefit is in itself is good enough. And uh, furthermore, there are these other benefits, namely overcoming of grief and lamentation, physical suffering, mental distress, and the indubities which are the causes of suffering, and, and, and the realization of path consciousness uh, uprooting the impurities which are the causes of suffering and realize the fruit of liberation. So it, it is simple and good. This is an assurance which nobody has given boldly. Only the Buddha has given it. So he, uh, the Buddha has, uh, has, has, has been boldly assured by the Buddha. If one has uh, faith in this assurance and practice uh, in accordance with the instructions, then uh, the Dhamma which one practices, if one practices in accordance with the principles of the Dhamma, this Dhamma will uplift, sustain, helps uh, the Dhamma practitioner, the one who practices in, the, in accordance with the principles of the Dhamma. So if However, if one is not able to practice in accordance with the principles of the Dharma, then the Dharma will not be able to sustain, help, or uplift, or improve the practitioner. The Dharma is impartial. So if one wishes to realize the benefit as assured by the Buddha, then all you have to do is just boost up your energy uh, during the days left, uh, as much as you are able to practice, exert your energy, you are bound to realize the benefit of the practice, the delight of the Dhamma. It is sure. So today, uh, says Sarah says, would like to give an uh, inspiring talk, and is prepared for that. What people are afraid of, on the, for that matter, all beings are afraid are these uh, existential sufferings of old age, sickness and death. You don't want to get old, you want to stay young, but you get old eventually. There's no denying about that. And you don't want to get sick, but one day you get sick, sometimes it can be, the sickness can be treated, maybe treated, or sometimes not. But anyway, lastly, uh, one gets sick with old age and dies. The people are very much afraid of these existential sufferings. So in this way, the beings, including the human beings, are driven towards that, just like a cow herd drives the uh, cattle to the pasture, whacking them with a the stick. They have to go. Nobody can, uh, no, no cattle or no cow can refuse that. So to for the beings, once you come into existence, you are driven towards this uh, old age and old age disease and death. Nobody can escape that. In the world, all beings are subject to this existential suffering, and they haven't got enough ability to overcome that, to escape from that. They are all driven towards that uh, nature, towards that place. Nobody can uh, refuse that, and uh, this is also impermanent, and not enough energy to overcome this existential suffering. So in this Padisa uh, Mita Mega, Pali is given this, uh, beings are gradually uh, driven or going towards this old age disease and death. Just like when the, there is a battle, between two opposing armies, <clears throat> the officer or the commanding officer sends the rank and file, the soldiers, to the front line so that nobody can refuse, nobody can withdraw, nobody can come back. Either uh, one wins or loses. 
Uh, nobody can refuse that. Everybody is driven towards the battlefield, to the front line. So too, the beings are driven towards old age, disease and death. So this is ground for sense of urgency and enthusiasm. And the Buddha said, uh, this knowing the uh, beings are facing or being, a, being sub subject to old age, disease and death, and uh, propounded this in order to cultivate this Samvegarnyana, knowledge of uh, sense of energy, sense of urgency and enthusiasm. Giving the parables, uh, if one is able to be convinced of this, then one will be able to uh, develop this wonderful courage to face these uh, existential sufferings. First of all, uh, the Buddha propounded or revealed the shortcomings of the beings. Uh, once one uh, has uh, reborn in an existence, then this old age, the three things, the old age, disease and death, are like wildfire uh, uh, coming towards these beings. Like no, wildfire. No, you mean what no, no. Wildfire, forest fire. Forest fire. <clears throat> This uh, forest, like forest fire or wildfire, <clears throat> uh, they surround these animals in the forest, uh, so that the forest, uh, the animals cannot escape. The animals cannot escape, although they run here and there, uh, and an end they succumb to this. So, uh, like this forest fire or wildfire uh, surrounding the animals, so too the beings are surrounded by this existential suffering of old age, disease and death. And uh, they have nowhere to, to run, uh, they have no, nothing to resist this uh, disaster. They have no capacity, no power to withstand uh, this situation, that is the shortcomings of the beings. And so too with their sickness, they cannot overcome, they have not enough power to overcome this like the wildfire or the forest fire, it surrounds the uh, beings with holy disease and death. There's said that uh, there's no power to resist this holy disease and death, and there's no escape route, nor is there any power or force or ability to escape from this escape route. But in the West, scientists are finding ways and means to assist these things, like they are finding methods uh, not to get old, to resist aging, and they are finding methods, they are looking for method, or uh, they said some sort of find method in order to resist uh, this suffering of sickness, and uh, also a method, they are looking for method to resist death or uh, to revive the person who just dies. In this way, they are challenging this existential sufferings of old age, disease and death. And uh, although the Buddha says that there is no power, but they are reversing this. And uh, escape route also, there is no escape route, and there is no ability, no, not enough force, not enough energy to escape from this escape route. So, uh, this, uh, the the method that the Buddha is finding is different from what the uh, scientists are finding and is are looking for. They are not the same. So, in the case of the Buddha, uh, we are now confronting or facing this holy disease and death. There is nothing we can do. Uh, but we look for the reason, the cause, and try to overcome this cause. Uh, try to uh, do away with this cause. So that is the difference between the Buddha's method and the scientists. The Buddha has given the second uh, weakness, shortcomings of the beings, that there is, uh, namely, that uh, there is nobody who stands, who can stand responsible and give assurance to resist this old age disease and death. 
Now, in other words, there's nobody to look after you, to guard against this existential suffering. So, uh, of course, uh, there, there may be some means not to relieve the situation, but not totally resist this existential suffering. So this is, is uh, the weakness of the beings is quite obvious. There's nobody to take responsible for that, to stand against, to resist, and to give assurance. Uh, so, but uh, the scientists are challenging the situation in this regard. England for training, I think, and uh, she stayed in the house with uh, elderly sisters maybe about 60 or 70 years. So she, as for her, this education is she lived very simply without any adornment and beautification. Uh, but uh, as for the two spinsters, they are always uh, uh, in front of the mirror trying to make uh, look young with uh, all the facial things, surgeries and everything in order to uh, improve their looks, looking at the photographs, and in the front of the mirror, they even cried with frustration, and facing this uh, uh, the old age, the suffering of old age. So they feel sad, and uh, of course uh, they did not give up. So daily they they were doing like this. And then uh, they told this uh, young woman, uh, why not, uh, you know, improve your looks, so you, are, so you are very young, why don't you do that? So this young lady said that uh, instead of, uh, you know, uh, improving the look, uh, the physical look, uh, she is uh, improving spiritual resistance against this old age and disease and death, which nobody can overcome. And uh, if you do that, it will be very tiring. What is important is to uh, develop this mental resistance power, mental stamina, in order to overcome this uh, grief and lamentation, so that one will be able, one can be able to withstand his worldly conditions. So, uh, in this way, she even that uh, they were not satisfied with her explanation. So in this way, uh, they got very frustrated and sad every day uh, and uh, not being satisfied with what this young lady explained. So there's no security assurance against uh, the old age, aging, but modern, modern, modern methods, uh, modern people, uh, People are looking for modern methods in order to resist this aging and sadness. The aging which uh, leads to sadness, this is the suffering of aging, old age. Not to, not to speak of, not to mention the suffering of sickness and death. So what is important is to look for the root cause of this existential, existential suffering. Where do they come from? Uh, they come from existence, of what? Of life. Because of the existence, or rebirth, this old age disease and death come. Without existence, these existential suffering will not come. Why does, does this existence arise? Or why does this life comes into being. Why, uh, why, why this existence? Is this uh, due to karma actions performed? So karma is the cause and the result is the rebirth and the life process which is subject to old age disease and death. So because of the actions performed, karma, uh, why do we perform this? Because we think it is good. Uh, because we think it is pleasurable, so we perform this. We do all these actions. We uh, everybody uh, performs because he or she thinks it is 
good. If he or she thinks it is not good, then he or she will not perform, as is given in this as Ambara as Ashoks or Asoka's stone inscriptions. That uh, the nature of the be- uh, being is that uh, whatever they do, they do because they think it is correct. Whatever they think correct, or they think uh, as correct, they will do it. That's why they do it, and this is quite uh, realistic. So, because of the karma actions performed, there is this uh, existence in the form of the initial existence that is rebirth and the proceeding, continuing ex- uh, uh, result, resultant, namely Ulish disease and death. Because one thinks that uh, things are good, they do it. Because they think it is pleasurable, they do it. Why do they do it? Why do they take pleasure? Why do they become attached? Uh, because they don't see the flaws of the existence. They don't see the defects of existence, or shortcomings of existence. Not seeing the truth, seeing in the wrong way. So not only that one does not see the defects, but one thinks that they are pleasurable, they are good, they have no defects. So with this uh, attachment, with this delight, uh, they perform the actions leading to existence. So the root cause is ignorance, not knowing the truth, knowing in the wrong way. So the, the fact that this mind-body process goes on lies, uh, has its uh, root cause in Avija as a head, and this Avija ignorance is very crucial. This samsara head, the head of the wheel of rebirth, is this uh, avijja, ignorance, uh, not seeing the defects, but seeing that they are pleasurable. That has been that is uh, that is that is past and gone. One cannot do anything about it, and because of this avijja. One has done karma physically, verbally, and mentally. We have done that, but also we cannot do anything about it. It is all here and now. It is with us. Uh, that is this uh, initial effect. That is rebirth, new life, and then this uh, continuity of life. That is all disease and death. These two also cannot be overcome, they are with us, and there's nothing we can do about it. So once this, uh, uh, we have done this performance, actions, uh, with, based on this Avija head, the head of Avija, we are bound to uh, experience, we are bound to suffer uh, uh, the benefit of this uh, rebirth, initial effect and uh, continuity of effect, that is uh, the existence, the process of life. So not seeing the flaws, not seeing the shortcomings of life. We all are uh, seeing the shortcomings of life, seeing these uh, defects, then all we have to do is just to strive not to let a similar existence uh, or we come into being. Similar existence come, uh, come, come into existence in a similar way. So we have to cut off this samsara head, avijja, so that we don't come into new existence, similar to the existence that we are now having. So in order that uh, uh, this avijja cannot arise, cannot happen, uh, even temporarily, momentarily, we have to practice to overcome this avijja, to uproot if possible, so that if there is no avijja, there will be no karma performed and there will be no existence, no life, no bhava. If there is no karma, 
then there will be no existence, initial or continue the process of life. And there will be no old age, disease and death. So one has got to cut off uh, the root cause. Now in the human being, the head is most important. And if one loses one's head, that is literally, then one will not be able to do anything. That is why if one is beheaded, once one is beheaded, then uh, the whole body is gone. If you want, if somebody wants to kill, then all he or she has to do is just be head cut off the head. That's the end of it. So the the samsaric suffering uh, is due to this head avijja. So one has got to uproot this, so that this avijja has not has not the chance to to to, to arise. Uh, this is the root cause of the samsara. So, with the practice of Satipatthana, we, this is a method, Satipatthana is a method, the remedy to cut off this, the root, namely avijja. So, from which side, how to cut off is the problem which we shall discuss. As is given this virina uh, pechaya tana, as uh, feeling or sensations, as condition, there arises this attachment tana. Whether this uh, sensation is good or bad or neutral, uh, there is bound to be this attachment. And to amplify this further, uh, there are these uh, striker elements, the six objects of perception, which impinge the base elements, namely eye, ear, nose, and six, six sense doors. Giving rise to these ignition elements like seeing consciousness, hearing consciousness, and so on, six kinds of consciousness, ignition elements. Now, because of the agreeable objects, there will be good feeling, pleasant feeling. And as a result of disagreeable objects, there will be this uh, unpleasant feeling. And as a result of this neutral object, there will be neutral feeling, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. So these are three sensations that arise out of agreeable, disagreeable, or neutral objects. Resulting in this, uh, 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 as a result of this uh, striker uh, at the ignition element, uh, six kinds of ignition elements such as seeing consciousness, hearing consciousness, and so on. There are these three kinds of sensations. These are the result of the past and also the result of the new rebirth, the continuity of life process. They are resultants. They're neither skillful nor unskillful. They're neither wholesome or unwholesome. They're neither kusala or unkusala. Kusala or, or Akusa. They are resultants. They are conditioned things, they arise and pass away. And as a result of Pasa Pichya Virina, as a result of Pasa contact, uh, with contact as condition, there arises this sensation, Virina. And as a result of sensation, there, are this, there is attachment to Na. So, which kind of person is affected by this attachment? This should be discussed from the practical aspect. This tanna cra craving, craving for pleasurable, agreeable objects, is like uh, trying to reach uh, the pleasurable objects, agreeable objects, objects uh, to which one is attached to, uh, to which one is attached. And when one grasps our object, there will be more and more craving, more and more attachment, from weak form of attachment to very strong, powerful form of attachment, so that one will not wish to let it go, and uh, one will wish to experience better and better, uh, pleasure, more and more pleasurable objects. One will wish to enjoy more and more pleasurable objects. In this way, one uh, clings in, uh, with senses, senselessness, 
in the sense of free. And also another kind of clinging, that is clinging uh, with this view, view of Atta, self or soul, that this is I who is clinging, the one who is clinging is I. So in this way, with wrong view, with distorted view, one may cling. In this way, there are two kinds of clinging, senseless clinging and view clinging. These are known as two kinds of upadana, uh, clingings, senseless clinging, clinging and view clinging, uh, leading to good and bad karma, good uh, karma leading to good destinies, like human destinies and so on, human existence and so on, and bad karma leading to lower states. In this way, when one comes to new existence, that's bound to be this uh, resultant old age disease and death. Uh, as we have said, this uh, very Napishyatana, with uh, feeling or sensation as condition, there arises this attachment. So in order that there is, uh, there does not arise attachment, we cut off at this stage. That's between Vedana and Tana. We have to insert this mindfulness practice in order to be aware of this uh, Vedana Pachyatana. You just apply mindfulness uh, when Vedana arises so that one does not go towards attachment, Tana. So every time one notes every seeing, hearing, testing, touching, as you said, to guard the mind all the time with mindfulness, vigilant mindfulness of every arising, deeply connecting with whatever is present, uh, concentrating the mind. In this way, one is bound to become aware of the mind and body, nama rupa, one of these uh, nama rupa, especially the nature of mind and body, especially these sensations, vedana. One will uh, be, one will know this Vedana, Vedana sensation as one notes. Well, one will know Sukha, if it's good feeling, one will know it as good feeling, Sukha Vedana. When it is bad feeling, bad sensi- unpleasant sensation, one will know as such. And when it's neutral feeling, one will also know as such, neutral feeling. So when one notes, one is bound to know these sensations. If one notes, one, one will know. Then when one knows the truth, know, know, knows me knows the truth, if one knows the truth, there will be no wrong knowledge. So because of the knowledge is not correct, there is this distorted knowing. The knowledge is wrong. Because of the uh, knowledge is not straightforward, uh, the knowledge becomes distorted. Now, because of this uh, knowledge of the truth, there will be no wrong knowing, no distorted knowledge. Uh, this uh, ignorance will not have a chance to arise in one stream of consciousness. With mindfulness, uh, uh, without mindfulness, one will not be aware of these sensations, virana. And if one is not aware of that, one will become attached. Not knowing, one becomes attached, as you say. And one, one, once become, one, uh, one becomes attached to something, then one will co- uh, wish to keep it, keep it with you. And then one will wish to enjoy better and better of more and more pleasurable objects leading to clinging, from attachment to clinging. This is about uh, uh, experiencing good objects. When one experiences good objects, one will wish to crave for better and better objects. But how about one encounters uh, unpleasant objects, unpleasant experience, unpleasant feelings? Because of the unpleasant feeling, one wishes, one uh, expects a pleasant feeling. That is again, that is also is attachment Outside. of the pleasurable experience, pleasant experience. This is included 
uh, and uh, this is considered as uh, pleasant. A calm feeling is something like very near uh, the pleasant feeling. So one one wishes to enjoy this. Keep it with you. One wishes one will wish to have more better and better calm feeling. This also is another kind of craving. So in this way, if one is mindful of every rising, as soon as it arises, like uh, every, every time one sees, hears, and so on, at the moment of seeing, hearing, then uh, one is bound to uh, notice, observe one of the three feelings, sensations, good, bad, or neutral. That means one comes to know uh, any one of these feelings. So when one knows, there will be no ignorance, no unknowing. Ignorance will be gone, because you know this uh, object, and there will be no ignorance. So, because of this uh, knowing, there will be no ignorance. Because of the knowing of the truth, there will be no knowing of the wrong wrong way, no uh, knowing in the wrong way. There, there will be no knowing of the truth, no knowing in the wrong way. Uh, no ignorance, no unknowing of, of the truth, and no unknowing of the wrong way. There will be knowing of the truth and knowing in the right way. In this way, the avijja head is, sub, is uh, said to be beheaded. So this is how one has got to do. Uh, as the saying, not knowing, one becomes attached. By knowing, one overcomes. There will be no attachment. One becomes detached. So that there will be no senseless clinging, no view clinging. If there is no craving, then this will not lead to clinging. If there is no tana, there will be no upadana. So that there will be no kama, gura, bed, perform, uh, not give, uh, and then that will not give result, give uh, the result in the form of bhava jati, that is rebirth in a new existence. If there is no rebirth and a new existence, no bhava jati, there will be no uh, continuing resultant, uh, namely this holish disease and death. So this resultant uh, feeling, good, bad, or neutral, has to be noted with the method of mindfulness, so as to know the truth. If one knows the truth, there will be no unknowing, no ignorance, not, uh, there will be no unknowing of the truth, no unknowing of no, in the wrong, no, knowing in the wrong way. So this vajra will not have a chance to arise one stream of consciousness. So in, in place of vajra, this uh, knowledge has taken the place. As I said, knowing by knowing, one overcomes attachment. One is detached. That means there will be no attachment, no tana, no clinging, upadana. So because uh, one does not see uh, the defects, in this way one thinks uh, they are pleasurable, one performs karma physically, verbally and mentally. Now one does not see, uh, one sees the defects, one does not see pleasure in these objects. And by noting this uh, virana, one observes its impermanent nature arising and passing away of the sensations, this is inside knowledge. And because uh, things are in a state of flux and nothing is uh, stationary, uh, they are unsatisfactory, especially when one experiences unpleasant sensations in the body. One knows that this body is a mass of suffering. And then this is not, there's nothing pleasurable, nothing satisfactory, and uh, things arise on their own, not at your will. They are non-self, selfless, impersonal, substanceless. So in this way, once one is able to cultivate insight knowledge through the uh, by le levels of insight knowledge, then one is able to cut off this head, the avijja, which is the head of samsaric suffering. Instead of avijja, if one is cut off this avijja, in place of avijja, there will be this vijja, knowing, knowledge. In place of ignorance, there will be 
knowledge, Vijja. So by being able to note and know these resultant sensations, one is able to uh, overcome this uh, new becoming in the form of this uh, bhava jati rebirth and the continuing resultant of all age disease and death. So the Buddha said that there's nothing you can do about this uh, bhava jati rebirth. Now you're born and you're living in a new existence. Uh, you're being born and because of the past deeds you have come into being and uh, this is past and gone, there's nothing you can do about it. The only thing you can do is not to let the uh, a new existence to come about. Cut off this root cause, that is avijja, which for which yogis are now practicing. Since this is this may be deep enough, not enough to uh, convince the yogis, some of the yogis, this will this subject will be continued tomorrow. 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 Tomorrow.